traumatic brain injury record keeping hospitalization criteria and medical management. Regular assessment and recording of the Glasgow Coma Scale score is fundamental to tracking changes in the level of consciousness over time. Frequent GEC assessments identify neurological deterioration or improvement. Changes in pupillary size reactivity to light or the presence of anisocoria indicate neurological changes or increased intracranial pressure, ICP. Significant changes in blood pressure can impact cerebral perfusion and should be addressed promptly to assess cardiac function and overall physiological status. Rapid changes in pulse rate may indicate pain or increased intracranial pressure, especially if a patient becomes bradycardic. Similarly, irregular respiratory patterns or rates can indicate increased intracranial pressure, as fever can affect brain metabolism and overall recovery. Monitoring temperature helps identify and manage infection or inflammation. Beyond the GCS and pupillary assessments, neurological observations should include any focal neurological deficits, motor responses, and presence of seizure, record fluid input and output, including fluid intake urine output and drainage lab results, should include blood counts, electrolytes, coagulation profile, and arterial blood gas analysis, ABG, record all medication, interventions performed, example, intubation, surgery, and treatment responses. CT, scans findings and interpretations in the patient's chart. Document any consultations with neurologists or neurosurgeons and their recommendations and assessments. Note any discussions or interactions with the patient's family or next of kin. Patients with TBI should be monitored with a neuroscience chart. The neuroscience chart includes the vital signs of patient's neurologic findings including the pupillae size and reactivity GCS, motor examination findings and the presence of seizure. Monitoring the neurologic condition of the patient helps detect neurological deterioration early. A drop in GCS by two signifies clinical deterioration and patient should be subjected to a repeat CT scan to see any new findings. Neurosign chart includes name, age, gender, medical record number, and examination date. The reason for the neurological assessment, including any specific symptoms or concerns reported by the patient. A brief medical history, including relevant past illnesses, medications, allergies, and recent travel or exposure to infectious agents. Blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, respiratory, and temperature at the time of the examination. Observations about the patient's general demeanor, consciousness, and level of alertness. Continue and record assessment of the patient's orientation, memory, attention, language, and overall cognitive function. Evaluation of the function of the 12 cranial nerve, including tests for visual acuity, pupillary response, facial muscle strength, and eye movements. Finally, complete with an assessment of muscle strength in various muscle groups. Evaluation of sensory function, including light touch pinprick temperature vibration and proprioception. Assessment of deep tendon reflexes, for example, patellar reflex, Achilles reflex, and other reflexes, example, Babinski sign. Examination of coordination, balance, and gait to assess cerebellar function. With the high cost of hospitalization and the advent of CT scans, the need for admissions following head injury has changed. Patients with moderate and severe TBI should be admitted. Mild TBI patients with a significant mechanism of injury who came within a few minutes to the hospital should also be admitted. ICU admission is required for those patients with severe TBI. Polytrauma patients need inpatient treatment for their injuries and to follow up on their TBI. Severe headache and vomiting after a head injury can be a concerning sign as it may indicate increased intracranial pressure. CSF leakage from the nose or ears is concerning and suggests a potential skull base fracture or other significant head injury. Diplopia following a head injury may indicate damage to cranial nerves, controlling eye movements or orbital fracture. Seizures can occur following a head injury and may be a sign of underlying brain and may be a sign of underlying brain injury. Admission is necessary for seizure management. Alcohol or drug intoxication 
can alter the clinical presentation and judgment of patients with head injuries. Special consideration should be given to very young, pediatric, and very old patients as they may present with atypical symptoms and be less able to communicate them effectively. When there is a concern that the patient may not have a reliable follow-up at the outpatient care, they should be admitted and followed up for some time. Patients presenting with loss of consciousness, motor deficit seizure, or anisocoria, are deemed to have increased ICP due to their TBI. Increased ICP should be treated as soon as possible. Head elevation is the simplest and effective measure for reducing the ICP. It facilitates venous outflow and decreases the mean carotid pressure, thereby reducing the ICP. Keeping the neck straight is also important to facilitate venous return and reduce the ICP. Well, maintaining normal blood pressure and avoiding hypoxia help in reducing increased ICP by preventing secondary brain injuries such as ischemic changes to the brain. Pain management is essential in reducing ICP. Osmotic agents reduce cerebral edema by drawing excess fluid out of brain tissue. Anticonvulsants are prescribed to prevent or manage seizures antibiotics administered with risks of infection, such as open skull fractures or penetrating injuries. Analgesia are prescribed to relieve pain associated with head injuries. Antacids prevent or treat stress-related gastric ulcers, which occur in critically ill TBI patients. Temporary hyperventilation, if intubated. Controlled hyperventilation with mechanical ventilation may be used temporarily to lower ICP. Sedation, to maintain patient comfort, especially if they require mechanical ventilation or are agitated. Use of steroids in head injury, not recommended. In the management of head injury is no longer recommended as studies have shown limited benefit and potential harm in the upcoming slide. We will provide more detail on specific medical management Manitol is an osmotic diuretic that is widely used to decrease increased ICP. We use Manitol whenever patients have signs of increased ICP. We should not give Manitol to patients having low blood pressure acute or chronic renal failure or serum electrolyte abnormalities. Whenever we plan to give Manitol, we should catheterize the patient and monitor urine output. Hypertonic saline is an alternate drug to Manitol. It is administered as bolus and the usual concentration is 3%. Lasix is given when mannitol or hypertonic saline is not available. All severe TBI patients should be intubated for airway protection, possible deep sedation, and hyperventilation. Hyperventilation should not be considered within 24 hours of injury to the brain. Prophylaxis anticonvulsants after TBI help reduce early post-traumatic seizure which occurs within seven days of head injury. The most widely used anticonvulsant in LMICS is phenytoin. Levetiracetam is also currently gaining popularity. Prophylaxis anticonvulsants should only be given for the first seven days after TBI. It should not be prolonged if patients do not develop seizure or if they do not have history of seizure previously. There is insufficient evidence to recommend levetiracetam compared with phenytoin regarding efficacy in preventing early post-traumatic seizures and toxicity. Patients with TBI may come late with their scalp wound being infected. We should start antibiotics for super-infected scalp wounds or for those with meningitis. The decision to start antibiotics depend on the type of injury, the presence of open skull fractures or penetrating injury, the patient's clinical condition and any identified pathogens through cultures. Broad-spectrum antibiotics are often initiated empirically while awaiting culture results. Pain management should be tailored to the patient's pain level and response to treatment. Acetaminophen dosing in pediatric patients should be based on weight. Opioids are used when non-opioid analgesics are inadequate or not suitable. Opioid dosing should be carefully titrated to achieve adequate pain relief while minimizing the risk of respiratory depression and sedation, non-pharmacological pain management techniques such as physical therapy, ice packs, and relaxation techniques can be beneficial in TBI patients, particularly when used in conjunction with medication. Managing gastrointestinal issues, such as ulcers or acid reflux. In patients with traumatic brain injury, 
is important as there is a risk of developing stress ulcers due to increased intracranial pressure. Temporary hyperventilation reduces intracranial pressure ICP, by inducing cerebral vasoconstriction, thereby alleviating the risk of brain herniation. Reduction of Pakatu results in vasoconstriction of cerebral blood vessels, decrease cerebral blood volume, and ICP. Controlled hyperventilation is typically to target specific Pakatu levels. This should be closely monitored to avoid excessive hyperventilation potentially worsening the patient's condition. The primary goals of sedation in TBI are to alleviate agitation and anxiety, provide pain relief, and ensure patient comfort. Sedation may also be used to control intracranial pressure, ICP, in certain situations, although this should be done cautiously as excessive sedation can lead to decreased cerebral blood flow. The objective of medical management of traumatic brain injury is to prevent secondary brain injury or to maintain the patient until they can access definitive surgical interventions.